Welcome back, guys. We're doing another uh, sin out of the box tonight. Um, the only announcement that I have is we're going to watch God's Not Dead 4 um, at my house next this coming Tuesday, our next meeting during our allocated time. Um, so if anybody wants to come and watch that, just message me in the group chat or message me directly and, and I'll give you the details on how to get there if you don't know or what time and everything like that. So Okay. So as Jeremy said, we're uh, continuing our sent out of the box and uh, tonight's issue is um, I'm having trouble trusting in God's plan and so I thought about this and um, and and what I thought we'd do is do another transformation worksheet for, you know just to, to see uh, how things uh, go uh, from God's perspective as far as you know our um, as far as this issue trusting in his plan and I'd say that this is something um, that a lot of people struggle with because we often just think of times, uh, circumstances that we feel like that God isn't there, or we feel like that we do, uh, we can do better uh, than God. Another aspect of that is. Um, we, we often know the right answer, but doing it is a different story. And so uh, tonight, we, I thought what we'd do, um, Jeremy, is just kind of look at two major passages, and uh, that's Jer uh, Genesis 3, 1 through Five and then um, First Samuel chapter thirteen, because these are, I think these two passages. One's a, um, a passage of why we're in the situation that we're in, and and the other is a product of that situation. So um, when I think of of this um, particular issue, uh, it reminds me of when I was um, thought I was called into the ministry uh, back in, in college, actually, his first year or so of, of college, and I, I ran away from, from that call. I, I was I don't know, I felt like that um, that maybe God didn't want me to do that particular uh, thing, to be in ministry. And so instead of, instead of trusting him and being obedient, uh, I ran and ran away from what I knew he wanted me to do. Um, and so I made I switched my majors completely. I ended up majoring in chemistry. Ended up going to work for a corporation. Lisa and I were married, started a family and everything. But that um, circumstance was it always was nagging at me. I always felt like that God was tugging at my heart, you know, because He had given me. Um, a call. He had, he had shown me what he wanted me to do, but I was I, I wasn't trusting 
in that aspect. I wasn't being obedient. So, you know, we all deal with, with that, and, um, and I, it all starts here in, in Genesis chapter 3. So, um, Catherine, read, read Genesis 3, 1 through uh, 5 for us. <clears throat> Okay, so when we look at um, this passage, what is one of the things that uh, you see? What's one of the insights that you gain um, from this? As far as knowledge and obedience. Just from the first verse of this chapter, um, it kind of, to me, they say that the devil will use millions of different angles to come at you mm -hmm. and try to get you off track with God. I think. Yeah. One of the things Scripture teaches us is... Um, We are bombarded all the time with, from three different areas. One is the devil that you pointed out. The other is the world, which the devil controls. God's allowed him to control. And then we have our own sinful desires because of, of the fall. Um, our, our hearts are tainted. Um, one of the things that we see is when you consider um, our heart and the dynamics that play in the heart, um, the Christian or, or so before we say the unbeliever um, is often described in scripture as being dead. We're dead people. Um, we are sinners. Okay. And so what that means is, is that when we were born we were born into sin. And so the whole of our heart is, is dead, it's black. It's black. When we're saved, When we're saved, oh man, you gotta get better than that. But 
for the saved person, his heart isn't, uh, and this is, let's say, the glorified person. So, before the fall and when we get to heaven, our hearts, the, the parts of our being, will be completely pure. <clears throat> but right now, we still, even though our hearts have been made new, we've been regenerated, we've been quickened, we've been made alive, Right? So we still, even though our hearts has been given life, we still have the product of the fall that is within them. So what we do is in, the, in some dark places, some, John Owen, the Puritan, calls it dark corners of our hearts, of our being, we still have these, these sins, these, this part of our nature that tugs and pulls on us. Um, C.H. Um, uh, yeah, Spurgeon said these are the hounds of hell that are nipping at our heels um, that uh, is constantly um, by Martin. So, and all of us, I don't, I don't know one Christian who doesn't have a sin, a predominant sin that they struggle with in some way or somehow. Uh, some people struggle with, uh, they're believers, but they, they may have been alcoholics and so they're, they're battling that their whole life. Uh, some may battle pornography. Some people battle maybe using profanity. Some people, you know, struggle with uh, or have authority issues and respecting authority. Um, so there's all kinds of different, we know, all kinds of different sins. So, so we're struggling uh, with that. Now, what we see here in Genesis 3 in our passage is that Satan knows how to attack us. Okay? Adam and Eve, they didn't have this like we do. Adam and Eve had this. They had pure hearts. They didn't have anything within their nature that was dark, was sinful. In fact, God had shielded them from that. He, he told them if they didn't eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, then they would have life. And one of, one of the things that we see in the passage is when Satan tempted Eve and she finally fell from, for it and she ate of the fruit, we're told her eyes were opened. Right? So up until that point, her and Adam, when they... When they... Um, walked in the garden, when they did their work, when they were together as husband and wife, everything that they did was done in a manner of seeing through pure eyes, through holy eyes. But when they sinned, then, uh, and ate of the fruit, then their eyes was open to what they had done. and was open to who Satan was. So they didn't have that experience. 
They didn't know anything about that. You know, a lot of people, you know, think, you know, wonder, well, what was Adam and Eve's eyes opened to? Was it open just to evil in general? Well, to a certain extent it was, but more specifically, their eyes was open to the fact that they had transgressed God's law. Now, what, what was the pull? What was the enticement? For them to do what they did. The, the devil tricked them, saying that they didn't know as much as God, saying that you eat of the tree, you'll know the knowledge of good and evil, mm -hmm. in which God is trying to keep away from you. All right, good. So, one of the things then. Um, you know, people think, and and it's true. There there was a pride issue that that it was um, the that pride was the reason that Eve fell, but it was it was more than just pride. It was the fact that she wanted to be like God. So it wasn't good enough that she was made in His image. What she wanted to do was replace God. And what that boils down to, the pride then was a result, it was really a fruit from a lack of trust. So we're coming back to the question. You know, I'm having trouble trusting God. How do I, how can I trust God's plan. Well, God's plan that Adam and Eve knew firsthand, they heard from God's lips, whatever that is. We know God is a spirit, so we don't know really how he, how he said these things, but he told them, do not do this. And God flat out told them face to face as he walked with them. We know the scripture said that he walked with them. God flat out told them as he walked with them not to do this. Okay, I want you to work. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy one another as husband and wife. Have children. Teach them my ways. Live in this perfect world that I've created that is good. That is good for you. You know, just live it up. That's the plan. And yet, Adam and Eve didn't trust the plan. Okay? So, when we look at the pride... So when we look at the pride, that manifested was the result of the fruit of what we did, what we see that the root that or the thing that took root in her heart was a lack of trust. Okay? This lack of trust rooted itself into <clears throat> Adam and Eve's heart. And the lack of trust always comes with a lack of obedience. Now, I believe 
from God's Word. I think I can make a pretty good argument from God's Word. For our saints, here um, we're dead, so we're always, there's, all, there's no trust and there's no obedience. Here, we have the same roots. Now we are learning trust. And we're learning obedience. Okay? Now, we know we know that learning trust and obedience is God's way of sanctifying us. So, we could say another definition for our sanctification is learning trust and obedience. Trust plus obedience. So, here, as we're learning trust and we learn obedience, then there's a Double fruit is a good way to put it. Grows from this. And it's called humble submission. So as God works in our heart and the Holy Spirit comes in, and he starts sweeping our cobwebs out. And he starts uncovering these dark corners of our heart. We start to learn to trust. And we start to learn obedience. And trusting and obedience is a two-sided coin. You can't have one without the other. If you're trusting God, then you're going to be obedient. If you're being obedient to God, trust will come. C.S. Lewis uh, made the statement about loving others. And I'm paraphrasing, I have another uh, quote by him too. But um, when it comes to loving your neighbor, some somebody said, you know, I, I just, I can't do it. I, can't, I don't feel love for my lo neighbor. And Lewis told him then, well, go start doing love for your neighbor. Just, just start doing loving acts for that person. And so the neighbor, the first person did. And after they started doing loving acts, then the emotion, the feeling of love began to grow towards that other person. So a lot of people think, well, you know, I can't, I can't trust God. I, I can't submit to him because I don't, you know, I'm, I'm struggling trusting him. Well, sometimes what we have to do is be obedient first. If we're obedient to what God's telling us to do, then the trust will come. But then sometimes it means that we're actually trusting and so we're obedient and so that we can be obedient. But when you are struggling with your having trouble trusting God's plan, 
one of the things that we see from in Genesis 3 is that what we need to do is start being obedient. And some people look at Genesis 3 and they say, well, you know, well, God just don't want you to have any knowledge. No, that's not, the, that's not what Genesis 3 is about. He wants you to know everything good. It's not a matter of not having you, keeping you from knowing everything. It's the fact that he wants you to have a holy knowledge. Okay. So there's, there's the, the, the starting point of our struggle of lack of trust. It's, it's Satan, it's the world, and it's our own hearts. Here it was a combination of Satan's work in Adam and Eve and their own heart. Because at this point, the perfect the world was perfect. All right? So 1 Samuel chapter 13. So there um, is... Where it began, let's see an Old Testament narrative. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 13. Let's see an Old Testament narrative of the struggle of trust in God. So, uh, all right, Jeremy, read verses 1 through 15. This first verse was like God and Alpha. Psalm. Psalm was seven years old. No, no, no. First Samuel. First. Yeah, it's like God and Alpha. Let's see that. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, read just just read it as it is. Saul was how many years old? It was one year. Saul was years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for two years over Israel. Okay. Saul chose three thousand men of Israel. Two thousand were with Saul in Michmash. Michmash. Michmash in the hill country of Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines, Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew his trumpet throughout all the land, saying, "Let the Hebrews hear." And all Israel heard it, said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops, like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped at Michmash to the east of Beth David. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed. The people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. 
And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from you, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up to Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about six hundred men. And Saul and Jonathan his son, and the people who were present with him, stayed in Geba, Benjamin, for the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned toward Ophrah to the land of Shual, another company turned toward Beth Haran, and another company turned toward the border that looked down on the valley of Zebulun toward the wilderness. Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords and spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistine to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and for the mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the Gileads. Uh, so on the day of the battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan, but Saul and Jonathan his son had them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to attack the All right. So, <clears throat> so what do you, what do you think um, these verses are are teaching us? This chapter. Saul did not wait on God. He didn't wait to the point in time when God told him to wait, and Samuel told him that. And so now God has not allowed his kingdom to reign forever mm -hmm. because he didn't trust him. Right. What well, What was happening to Saul? Okay. Someone's already fighting. Who's a, who who was already fighting? The name starts with the J. Jonathan. Remember who Jonathan is? Who, remember who Jonathan was? He was David's friend, but who was he before David's friend? He was Saul's son. Okay, so, so Jonathan is Saul's son. And Jonathan is out fighting these Philistines. Saul's tied up over in bed. He's, he's got some other issues going on. So, but Jonathan, is, he's in the, the throes of war. And they had had some success in the beginning. But now the Philistines said, well, we're not going to let this little twerk beat us. So they go and get 30,000 plus men with their chariots and their horses and they come back upon Jonathan. Now Saul feels like they should win just because they're Israel. He's the first king. This, this chapter happens if you look back at the end of chapter 12. Chapter 12 is 
when Saul is coronated as king, he's, he's anointed as king, and Samuel gives this big, long address. And if you look towards the end of, of chapter 13, he says, um, you know, for the Lord's not going to forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it's pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, and far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Alright, so here's just a, a, another phrasing of the same command that God's given to Israel ever since he brought them out of Egypt. I mean, this is Deuteronomy 6 language, right? This is, this is Joshua 1 language. Do, do good, obey the Lord, and you shall prosper. If you don't do good, if you act wickedly, then you won't. So Israel goes from Moses through the judges with no king. And they beg, beg, beg. God, we need a king. God, we need a king. God, we need a king. This guy said, okay, I'll give you a king. And he appoints Saul to be their king. But in this whole coronation speech, he tells both Saul and Israel, you still have to obey the commands of the covenant. If you don't obey the commands of the covenant and you act wickedly, then you're going to be in trouble. To Israel, he says, if you act wickedly, I'm going to sweep all of you. To Saul, he says, you're a representative of Israel. If you act wickedly, then, you all, then your sins is going to cause havoc upon the rest of the nation. And particularly upon your own household. Well, you have that great celebration and coronation and woe and behold, what happens in the very next chapter? <clears throat> Saul loses his favor. Why does he lose his favor? Because he becomes king and he doesn't trust God. Samuel had told him, wait until I get there. Wait. And Saul sees that Jonathan's losing and all of Jonathan's men are running into caves and into holes in the ground and into the tombs to get away from the, you know, this big garrison of Philistines that's coming after him. They're losing the battle. He thinks Samuel's not coming. Samuel said, wait for me, I'm coming. And Saul says, Samuel's not coming. Uh-oh, uh, uh, let me step in the place of God and do things my way. And so what does he do? He goes into the uh, into this this um, worship mode, he puts him, himself in the place of Samuel, and he starts to do priestly duties. He's not the priest, and he's not a prophet. He's just a king. So he steps out of his role of king and places himself in the role of priest, and he says, let me do this because Samuel's not going to come and God's not doing things fast enough. So the roots that we find in Adam and Eve are now manifesting themselves in the first king of Israel. Their lack of trust produces a lack of obedience and thus manifests pride. It's 
So, what happens next? What is, what is, look, look again. So Saul explains himself in verses 11 and 12. So, what does Samuel tell him in verse 13? 13 and 14. Yeah. What have you done, Saul? I mean, I just coronated you. I just anointed you. Can't I? Just did this. I, I just told you what to do, and you went against that. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God. You have not done what he told you to do. And then what becomes the consequence? The same two verses. He um, said that your, your kingdom will rise with the Lord. Yeah. It will be <laughs> David's kingdom that will be the line that lasts forever. It's David's kingdom that will be the line that the Christ, the Messiah, will come from. And the reason it becomes David's kingdom is because Saul didn't trust God. He didn't obey the Lord. And so Saul first opportunity and he blew it. And so um, the Lord sought another who of course we know to be David. David will become Jonathan's friend. It will be a long time before David even gets to become king because Saul will again continue to beat back God's plan for his life. But he ends up having to give in. So, all right, so those are some insights that we gleaned from this passage. So, what's some things then? What would you say are some things that you need to put off of your own life so that you can trust God and His plan? What's in other words, what is keeping you? What are some of the roots of your heart that is keeping you from being obedient to God? What are some roots that are keeping you from trusting Him? Both sides of the coin. Yeah, but what what kind? Well, what are some specific things? Like your own personal desires, what you want for your own life in the future, mm -hmm. or maybe you want trust in the uncertainty of the future. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. Can you get even more specific than that? Again. So right now, what is keeping you from that? Is it the test in two weeks? Is it, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I mean, you got to search your own heart. But what things are, are keeping you from for trusting God that he has a perfect plan no matter what the outcome is.
Um, you mentioned Caitlin while you're at the stopping place right there. You mentioned your friend Caitlin a while ago and um, her maybe might get on this next test. Imagine yourself in her position. What would you think, feel, do if you didn't pass that test and you were told you had to go back and start all over? What would be your um, heart attitude? Let's say heart dynamic. What would be your heart dynamic if that happened to you in light of what we learned tonight? I guess for me personally, I would think it would be I would ask God probably two questions. One, did I do something that I wasn't supposed to? Like, did I not trust Him completely? And then two, um, I would ask, is this not what you want me to do? For me, me personally, that's what I would do. Mm -hmm. But I can see how you know, someone else that isn't more mature in their faith might be mad. Mm -hmm. so, for me personally, I think I would ask, did I do something I wasn't supposed to do? Did I not trust him completely throughout my whole college career? Or is there something else that you really want me to focus on mm -hmm. other than her? Uh, and that's great because you, you're showing, you know, a real maturity from, you know, say a year ago um, because your focus would have been completely different then. But you really, you really are growing to now the focus is more on and remember we, we can ask God why. Scripture teaches us that. We may not get the audible answer but um, but there will be an answer somehow closed door and another open one so <clears throat> so so you got your things that you're going to put off so what would you put on so, so write down the things that you need to put on how would you put on Christ in, in this um, situation as far as trusting God, trusting Him with that test, trusting Him with that future relationship, trusting Him with, you know, family members' health conditions, and all, you know, all of those things. Okay, so what we want you to do, this is, this is your homework for this week. So what I want you to do this week is um, work on your plan for change. You, you can write it on that side of the sheet or you can journal it, either one, both of them is journaling. I see you probably got something already down, but... But work on it, but what, work on it with these other three passages. So Romans 4, 16, 21, Ephesians 3, 20, and Hebrews 11. So write that those down under your plan for change. And study in them. If you want to, you can... 
use your uh, use some, a commentary or something. You know, if you need help or you study Bible. Um, but but study them, study the context, remember how to do that, and um, look at your insights that you gain from it, and then how can you apply it? What do you need to change your life? As far as those um, three passages in light of the two that we looked at tonight, what things do you need to change? And then we can talk about it maybe next time. Before we do another one. All right. Any questions? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight and thank you for your grace in our life and we thank you uh, for what you do. And we just pray, oh Lord, that you uh, just continue to be uh, with us. Help us, oh Lord, uh, to trust you in all things that we may live for you and glorify you. That we might glorify you not just with our words, but with our actions, with our obedience. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.